All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's uh, commission meetings. Before we get started, I just want to make a couple announcements before I call Mr. James Hurd up. Um, and the first one is, is that our city manager is not going to be here this morning. He'll be arriving around 1130. And so assistant city manager Doug Matthews is up here with us today. Um, because of his absence of the, this morning, we are going to go ahead and push back item number seven, which was a discussion item um, and an update on the human rights ordinance. We're going to push that back to our two o'clock meeting. So we have a special meeting today at 2 p.m. And so we will have an action item at the beginning of that meeting, and then we'll have the discussion and the update by our city manager at that time. So just as an FYI, everyone. Um, also, commissioners, remind you that we have executive session right after Committee of the Whole. So we will uh, call that question at the end of the meeting, and we'll go down to our attorney's office. We have a number of items before us. We have two legal opinions and then updates on uh, labor negotiations. So I will be asking for that at the end of the meeting. And with that, we will get started today. We're going to kick off today's meeting uh, with James Hurd. I'll have him come on up and talk to us about the American Public Works Association Michigan Chapter Project of the Year Award. So welcome, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, City Commissioners, Assistant City Manager. Good morning. Uh, very excited to be here. I'm here actually as a representative of the American Public Works Association Michigan chapter to present a Project of the Year award to the City of Grand Rapids. So I have a different hat on today. <laughs> you may be aware that I serve on the leadership of the APWA Michigan chapter, most recently as president for nearly 700 members in Michigan. APWA is comprised of approximately 30,000 members strong across this country as well as Canada. Our mission is to serve the men and women within the public works profession who work 24 seven to deliver essential services to all communities across this country. These services include providing safe drinking water, treatment of wastewater, snow and ice control, filling potholes, designing and constructing roads and bridges, collection of trash and recycling, maintaining parks, trimming trees, managing traffic signals and street signs, maintaining equipment, the list goes on and on and on. Public works touches every citizen in this whole country. Before I present this award, I want to recognize a few people who are standing near me that made this project a success. From the City of Grand Rapids, Chuck Schroeder, from the Environmental Services Department, uh, John Hayes from the City Engineering Department, Lexi Burt and Tom Grant from the Design Consultants of Hubble, Roth and Clark, and our contractor from Diversco Construction Company, Mark Robinson. These folks made this project work. It was a success and I'm going to highlight that for you in just a moment. The Project of the Year Award is for the Sanitary Force Main and Market Avenue. The project is in the one, point, or one to five million dollar category, and here's a brief description of the project. With the city's now separated sewer system, the former combined trunk sewer carries only sanitary flow. In an effort to continue improving stormwater management, this project installed the concentrated waste force main to move the city further towards their goal to become zero or net zero. One of the larger commercial customers Founders Brewing Company exceeded expectations and hosted a discussion for all related parties to confirm startup procedures for the new concentrated waste system at the water resource recovery facility. Due to the density surrounding commercial properties, it was essential to minimize traffic impacts during construction. Hubble, Roth and Clark utilized installation methods such as jack and bore, directional drill, pipe ramming, and mounting pipe within existing conduits to reduce traffic impacts. Now, I know you all know what that means. <laughs> to safely and effectively construct the new force main within the trunk sewer, Diversco fabricated a specialty vehicle. This vehicle was a platform mounted on four rubber tires independently steered and, and powered by propane-fired motors. The final project cost $3.3 million and was finished in January 2019. It is my pleasure, on behalf of the APWA Michigan chapter, to present this Project of the Year award to the City of Grand Rapids. Congratulations on the award. I'll pass that on to you, Commissioner. I want to show it to you. All right, let's see it. And I think Steve's going to get a picture with our team. All right. <clears throat> Do you want a picture with the full commission? Sure. We're Steve, you have your preference? All right, Commissioners, why don't we go down? This is a really significant honor for our city. It is. We'll take it. We'll hold it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody come on up front. I feel like I'd be an imposter. <laughs> I mean, 
Come on, down here. 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 Come on, down All right, thank you. And I'm going to add my congratulations from everyone up here. Uh, every day we have hundreds and hundreds of employees out there in public works doing incredible work throughout our city. Uh, and the rough days, I remember all of them out there working hard during the polar vortex to the sweltering days of heat. Uh, so I just want to add my thanks for your service and all of your work in our community. And you know, we have a lot to be proud of in the city of Grand Rapids. I, have the opportunity to go around the country and to talk to folks about things happening here in the city. And almost every time I talk about public works, people will bring up the fact that we have a separated sewer system, which a lot of cities are still working hard to make that happen. So a lot of good work happening. All right, with that, we'll go to our second item, which is an action item. This is a resolution approving the revised liquor license application from Celebration Banquets, LLC. And this is changing the license category to a resort liquor license. Can I get a motion? S support. All right, hello, welcome. Good morning. So Celebration Banquets uh, was approved for their new Class C liquor license to be issued under MCL 436.1521A1A. Um, it has since been determined by the Michigan Liquor Control Commission that they do not qualify for this license. Therefore, we are requesting that they be approved for a resort economic development license instead. Thanks. And commissioners, you'll recall um, we've had this issue come up in the past as well. Uh, and so it's really a technicality and a switch from one type of license to another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. Thank you. All right. Next, commissioners, can I get a resolution approving a request for Commissioner Jones to attend the MML conference, which is going to be in Detroit this year? So votes. Support. All right. Anyone else? Does anyone else wish to attend? I know I emailed you about that. And Okay. All right. Commissioner Jones will be representing the city. Mm -hmm. All Commissioner right. All Jones those in favor home. say aye. Aye. Those opposed? <laughs> it carries. All right. Next, that will take us to a Vital Streets Oversight Commission presentation. Uh, so, commissioners, I know all of you know that we've been working hard uh, on our Vital Streets plan and the work that we're doing around Vital Streets uh, for several years now. And this is an update on the annual report. So it looks like we have a number of guests with us today. Um, let's see, who am I kicking this off with? Uh, with Josh? Okay. Uh, so before, uh, before Josh starts with this presentation, I want to add my thanks. A lot of folks serve on the Vital Streets Commission. Uh, we all see the long list of folks who stepped up uh, to serve after the extension of the income tax. And they do incredible work. And I just want to thank them for their service. So as Asante pulls that up, we will turn it over to get an update. All right, commissioners, uh, assistant city manager, I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present the Vital Streets Oversight Commission annual report today. My name is Josh Duggan, and I serve as the current chairperson of the committee. Uh, the condition of our streets has dramatically improved since we began our work in 2014. In 2013, the Sustainable Streets Task Force recommendation included the information in the top half of this graphic here. Uh, you can see that our streets were 60% poor with a possibility of being 87% poor by 2019 if there was no new investment. The bottom half shows our progress. We've reversed the trend and are now back to a condition not seen since 2002. Our goal is to reach 70% good and fair by the end of fiscal year 2030 when the vi current vital streets <coughs> tax is set to uh, complete. Uh, prior to the 0.2% income tax extension vote in 2014, the City Commission passed investment guidelines. These were promises to our citizens on how the funds would be spent and accounted for if the measure were approved. 
We are happy to report that we are fully compliant with these guidelines. And next is a summary of the work to date and the proposed investments that uh, you all have approved for fiscal year 2020. We have invested $92 million in Vital Streets funds and have reached a condition of 60% good and fair. That's versus the 87% not good and fair that would have been the, uh, the alternate uh, reality had, had we not made this investment. For fiscal year 2020, the approved budget will result in work on 31 miles of streets and approximately $14 million in new investment from Vital Streets funds. The work will include preventive maintenance, rehabilitation, and reconstruction on our federal aid urban, major non-federal aid urban, and local streets. Once again, I'm sure you know what those all mean. And uh, now I'm going to bring Rick up to get a little bit more into the details. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, throughout the Vital Streets program, we have gathered the sources and uses of the funds. The top pie chart um, shows the $31.9 million in investment that's proposed for 2020 fiscal year. A couple of notes. Um, state investment has now reached the $6 million that was anticipated from, from the very start of the program. Also, the income tax extension revenues are exceeding what was uh, anticipated when we, we began. Finally, for this fiscal year, the anticipated grant amount is quite a bit more than we typically see, and some of that is related to um, we did receive more grants this year. Uh, usually, we, we receive about $3 million. Um, also, just the timing of some of the grants resulted in it being in this year as well. And a couple of notes with the bottom pie chart, the uses. Um, we continue to fund the uh, right-of-way green infrastructure maintenance. That work is done by the Public Works Department. Um, you'll see in there also the transfer to sidewalks, which was part of the investment guidelines and, and part of the the income tax extension. Um, if you also recall, uh, we issued 50 million in bonds at the very start. Um, the second bond issue, um, the principal, is, is due um, in August of 2020, and that's $15 million. So the goal with this fiscal year and the amount that's set aside is to have those dollars uh, fully available by the end of this current fiscal year. Rick, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. With the income tax uh, coming in higher than anticipated, are we taking some of those additional funds and paying down um, the bonds or interest payments? The, there, with the three bond issues, the first two were balloon payments. Okay. So um, we paid the one off, I think it was a year and a half ago. The second one um, will be paid off again in August of 2020. And then the third bond issue of $18 million was spread over 10 years. And so there'll be a continuing amount of principal and interest of about $2.5 million for that one. Is but, there not, is, and, and we don't ever pay those off early? Is that, a, um, is that an option, it, it the be, $18 million one? We, we could look at um, the way the bond issue is set up. Some of them you can pay off early, some you can't. Um, basically what we've done is any additional dollars have been uh, invested in the local streets. Ah, okay, good. So among the other factors that are in considered with the investment that we, we plan, um, the investment guidelines called that we consider for balance and distribution. So you'll see um, the very first pie chart on the left is where we think we will end up after this just completed fiscal year. Um, and, and every year it's a, it's a course correction. So you'll see in 2020 uh, there's a heavier investment in, in the second ward. And then the third pie chart on the right is with all fiscal years through FY 2024 and, and then we're back in balance again. 
So we're often asked questions about which streets we invest in. And, and really the first factor is um, the current condition and the asset management plan. So we invest heavily in streets that uh, we're maintaining the investment and they haven't gone to a, a poor condition. Um, we also look at what the recommended level of funding was in the Sustainable Streets Task Force re report. So that's critical. Um, in the Vital Streets Plan, we pulled together an analysis of uh, the demographic need and connectivity opportunities. So that becomes a heat map that helps us look at areas where an investment uh, really improves the connectivity work. Uh, neighborhoods of focus is one thing we look at as well. We look at investment by others, both outside private investments as well as our um, infrastructure that we're doing in grants. Um, and then also what we hear from, from citizens and other stakeholders. And I know we, you can all attest with getting emails and calls <laughs> on conditions of streets. So we look at that information and um, quite often when it's in really poor condition, um, we utilize our public work staff and they do temporary paving which holds them in reasonable condition until we can get the final uh, treatment done. But, uh, and they are, they are doing a very excellent job with the work that they've done. <clears throat> this is the scheduled work with sidewalks. As I mentioned, a portion of the dollars from the income tax increase are dedicated to the sidewalk program. Um, just a couple of highlights from what we've done this past year. We've um, completed a systematic repair contract, one in each ward. Uh, this past year, we've done about 44,000 square feet of sidewalk uh, that's been repaired. Um, roughly 21% of our system has now been um, inspected and or repaired. Um, this amounts to uh, We've done 43 miles of sidewalk, inspected and repaired. We've also improved uh, 580 uh, ADA ramps for American with Disabilities Act and um, improved those. And this past year, we uh, installed 1.3 miles in, in new sidewalk. We're finishing up a couple of those contracts with the owner request piece and then also um, with the ADA ramp work. So for FY 2020, um, 7.45 million will be used towards, towards the work. Um, and as you can see, the various breakdowns, um, we're upping the amount of the um, systematic work. We're doubling that to 900,000. So that will be 300,000 in each ward. Um, the owner requests, thankfully, have uh, steadied, so, um, but we'll still dedicate 450000 to that. We'll have an ADA ramp contract, and then um, part of the dollars will be used also as the local match for a TAP grant, a Transportation Alternative Program grant. And what that will be used for is to construct sidewalk on Plainfield Avenue from I-96 to the North City limits. So, once that is complete, um, both Grand Rapids Township and Plainfield Township have completed their sidewalk out along that stretch. And uh, so you'll basically be able to go up to five mile roads. Um, Layla Aslani is going to talk about the engagement piece. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to give you a brief recap of our engagement efforts so, um, for last season, and it was a busy one. We held 19 public meetings in neighborhoods, four meetings with businesses or organizations, held a bucket pour celebration, as shown in the image um, on the bottom right corner, to demonstrate the new permeable brick block pavers on Atlas Avenue. And I'll talk a little bit more about that project in a bit. Um, continued to enhance our road construction webpage, as shown in the top right image, sent out almost 40,000 pieces of mail, responded to over 350 three-on-one service message requests, and grew our email distribution list by 
We continue to offer a high level of service for our Vital Streets projects engagement. I'm now going to share some highlighted projects from this past construction season. These projects feature green infrastructure and multimodal transportation and placemaking enhancements. They also meet the Vital Streets design guidelines and investment guidelines and involved community engagement. So this is a picture of Atlas Avenue, um, a before and after from Wealthy Street to Lake Drive. For this project, we did engagement with the East Town Neighborhood and Business Associations, and they told us that speeding and cut through traffic was a concern on this street, and they also desired to bring um, a shared street aspect to it that they could potentially use for um, community events. So to slow traffic, we added driveway approaches on both sides of the street to make it a little less enticing for people to use to cut through. And we also offset the street near Wealthy Street. This project also has the distinction of being our first full width permeable block paver street in the city. And in the picture on the right, you can also see we added street trees to further enhance the street and infiltrate, infiltrate stormwater. Our, the second project is Wealthy from Commerce to Division. With this project, we narrowed the driving lanes to slow traffic and provide room to install a wider sidewalk to better the experience for people walking. We also planted some trees where trees previously did not exist. Um, we also removed the awkward and unsafe intersection between Old Wealthy and Wealthy. And Old Wealthy was essentially a ramp um, that went from Ionia to Wealthy Street. But we did maintain the sidewalk there so people can still walk through there. And we narrowed that street and planted street trees and a rain garden. And we did a lot of engagement for this project. We met with the property owners nearby to make sure that the changes we were making could still serve their access needs. Next up, we have Dickinson from College to Eastern on the southeast side of our city. This disconnect that's shown in the picture um, has been there for decades. And as part of this project, we asked the residents, do you want this put back? Do you want it reconnected? What do you want? And they ultimately voted to put it back. But we made more enhancements to it because people cutting through, basically driving over the sidewalk, um, was an issue. So we added um, more bollards and also provided a cutout in the middle so that people on bikes going either north or south or east or west could still get through without having to maneuver up on the sidewalk and around. We also worked on two nearby streets as part of this project and planted street trees and installed infiltration basins to process stormwater. Last but not least, we have Lake Michigan Drive from Maynard to Collindale. We installed a new sidewalk where there previously did not exist one. And this is part of our efforts to fill in sidewalk gaps um, throughout our city. And I drive Lake Michigan pretty frequently and I see people using it pretty often, so that makes me happy. Um, the residents were a bit concerned because having a sidewalk was a new idea for them. And through the engagement efforts, we were able to put the sidewalk in a place where you know it wasn't right in front of their house, too close to their house, but it was far enough away from the road to make shoveling the sidewalk a little bit easier in the winter. I'm now going to turn it over to Carrie, who's going to talk about green infrastructure. Now, many of you saw similar pictures to this when Stormwater Commission presented a few weeks ago, but this slide really represents what makes vital streets in our city unique across the nation and even into Canada when I've presented to those types of audiences. The way we incorporate green infrastructure and the way our departments work together to incorporate everybody's needs is completely unique. Um, the way that we all work together in the design team process we all know each other's goals and we know each other's constraints. So you can look at the leaching catch basin that's at Granville and Pleasant and say that's great for stormwater, but you may not realize that that's also kind of our sneak attack approach. When we have so many constraints and we're trying to get bike lanes and we've got utilities and everything else and we don't have space to do something above ground showy, we put in a leaching catch basin that's going to infiltrate just like the others and get that water quality aspect and reduce the flow of stormwater, it's just in a little tiny space that it can fit and it doesn't always show up top. But then you look at the bioswills on the rest of Century in Granville, and um, I encourage you to take a look at them now because they've grown in really nicely and they look much better. Um, these are just south of Wealthy. 
but you look at the bioswale on Century, and that's not just a stormwater thing. That is a buffer area that protects the new bike lane in there. So these are just represent some of the ways that we all work together when we're working on green infrastructure in the city and incorporating it into our vital streets. Mayor? Yep, go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I just want to comment on the green infrastructure, and um, thank you, Carrie, for that. Um, presentation and Layla as well as you pointed out Atlas Street uh, which was an area in East Town where there was a lot of stormwater um, there were a lot of pro problems with the um, stormwater getting into the basements of some of those buildings around there so that was that was a really wonderful project and it's so attractive and I do want to mention and this is because of a tour that I was able to uh, attend uh, Wendy Ogilvie from Algro invited me, and Carrie, you were involved in it, and others, other staff persons, funded by the EPA, the Great Lakes um, Re Restoration, National Fish and Wildlife Initiative, and Five Star Urban Waters Restoration Grant. We took a tour throughout the city and looked at some wonderful uh, rain gardens, bioswales, and projects that involve Plaster Creek, Lamberton Creek, Indian Mill Creek, and um, and one of the things that I want a takeaway that I wanted to share with this group, our commission, is that we have an opportunity to become involved in this um, National Green Infrastructure Initiative. And the reason I bring it up is it really strikes me as a similar situation as we had with urban forestry, where we did not have foresters or arborists. And so as we began to recognize our tree trees as great assets for not only stormwater, but aesthetics and shade and preservation of our, our streets and sidewalks. We now recognize that green infrastructure is um, an opportunity that uh, we have to daylight streams and not only make our, um, capture our stormwater, but also beautify the city. However, we do not have the expertise in the city yet, um, other than, uh, people like Carrie, but to really go out and inspect those, maintain them, and protect them. So I would highly um, encourage this body to consider supporting um, this National Green Infrastructure Certification. It's an opportunity for us for workforce development here in the city and to actually take care of the assets because we are all about, Vital Streets is all about preserving our assets and, and looking at that from asset management so that we do not ever get in this position where we have 60 or 70 percent poor infrastructure. Now we are heading in the opposite direction. I'm very proud to have served for two years on the Vital Streets Steering Committee and, and out of that process has come um, really a robust citizen engagement around this. So we have people sitting at the table in a stormwater oversight committee as well as Vital Streets Oversight Committee. We really appreciate that. Um, Josh Duggan looks like you had to, there you are, you're still here. Thank you for your involvement in that and of course the Bicycle Coalition as well. But, but um, I'm not going to be around this table to push this so I'm making a big push this morning for you to understand that there is this certification. It's a, it's a huge opportunity in so many ways for the city. Yeah. And thanks for the opportunity to go on the tour. Thanks Commissioner. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that Commissioner and it's um, aligned with our strategic plan, but also all of our goals around being an environmentally friendly and sustainable city. So it's, it's really important work. Thanks. All right, welcome back. All right, uh, Kristen isn't here to speak directly on this, so I, I will. Uh, Kristen is here, but she, I think she's deferring to you. We'll just do a quick, obviously you approved the, the city's first bicycle action plan a few weeks ago, uh, but of course that was based on the Vital Streets plan and it was had a, a very grounded foundation in that as well as a new citywide strategic plan. And so going forward from implementation, um, one of the key features is going to be tracking very hard with the Vital Streets projects. We have up to this point, that's that sort of complete streets component, uh, but we're actually doing our kind of short range planning now um, since that plan was a longer range plan and taking a look at the capital program that Rick's team has laid out in engineering, and we want to do the same with James's group and Public Works in terms of their paving projects, even those, though those are um, shorter term type projects and more Band-Aid uh, kind of get us through to the next bigger project. Um, all of those have opportunities, especially given the focus of the new bike plan with so many streets on the secondary street network being as a focus for low stress network, it's gonna be very important to pair on both of those work programs for both vital streets and the, 
funds that we use for public works projects. So those are the main components of that. Uh, obviously there's other elements of the bike plan, but it, how it syncs with Vital Streets is, um, we'll be tracking very closely with them, <laughs> so. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And here we have a map of the fiscal year 2020 projects. Uh, we plan to make this available on the Vital Streets website uh, through our construction updates link so that the public and yourselves can go uh, take a look at what is planned through uh, next June. Last, I want to thank you for your support of the Vital Streets program and your help communicating our work to residents and stakeholders. Back in April, I attended my first Kids Speak event here in these chambers. I was struck by how many kids spoke about feeling unsafe walking and biking in their neighborhoods. Every child deserves safe spaces to walk and ride so they can get outdoors, play and explore their surroundings, and get to the nearest park, library, convenience, or grocery store. We are working toward that goal with the continued implementation of our Vital Streets plan and the new Bicycle Action Plan, plus the city's upcoming work around Vision Zero that is in the pipeline. These investments are critical, but if they are to be successful, we must continue to push ourselves in our community to do more. So we need you to uh, continue to make investments, more education, and more work to protect vulnerable road users. Uh, there's a lot of progress through the <coughs> safe passing and uh, the driving change program. So kudos on that. Keep going. And I ask that you keep listening to residents like these kids who may struggle to make their voices heard by policymakers. I ask that you keep the Vital Streets Oversight Committee and the city staff accountable to the residents that we had the pleasure of serving. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Any questions? Thanks. I'll start with questions. Uh, Commissioner Kelly? Yeah, I have a question since uh, we ended with the bicycle presentation. Uh, it's, I, I guess it's for you, Kristen. You, um, you worked in Milwaukee. I mean, we just saw this, we had a presentation on the Vital Streets, um, the bicycle plan recently. And we've been at this for several years. Um, Josh, you brought up a good um, con a concern about investing in this, our, our Vision Zero and our um, driving change program. I too was at Kids Speak and heard the same comments from the children in the neighborhood. I know I lived on my bike when I was a kid. That's how I got everywhere, to school and back and everywhere else. Um, can you give us a sense, Kristen, about um, comparing what you went through in Milwaukee to Grand Rapids around staffing? Because we're eager to get this done. And um, can you give us a sense of what that looked like here compared to Milwaukee in terms of timeline and, and actually following through on some of these? And you want a specific for the bicycle plan? Yes, okay, the bicycle so, plan. Yeah, so I manage the... Um, I eventually called it, they just called it active transportation. So I handled bicycle and pedestrian work. I didn't necessarily do what John Hayes did, mm -hmm. uh, managing the kind of annual work programs, but we dealt with anything that related to pedestrian crossing, school safety, which was in partnership with our police department and our school districts. Um, eventually went from one person to having an engineer that was assigned to me, uh, a junior level engineer. And then that program has grown to where there's two planners, an engineer, and that per position I had was elevated and they still maintain their bicycle and pedestrian coordinator. So there's roughly five people handling things in the city of Milwaukee. Now, city of Milwaukee is obviously a much larger city. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, 100 square miles, so about double the size of the physical okay. size, about 600,000 people. Um, very dense uh, neighborhoods and a lot of similar, you know, bridges and dense neighborhood streets. And um, it had a bike plan from roughly about 2010 and then the recommendation to try to expand that um, or update that plan at that time. So I think some of it is using the capacities that we have in, in our other departments is important. Uh, I think where we'll struggle sometimes with capacity is gonna be some of our other objectives within the bike plan. Uh, people want you know, to uh, have information resources, they want to um, better signage, uh, and just having the resources to not only plan those elements, but get them on the ground mm -hmm. amongst all the extra work. I know when I worked in Colorado, I started as a solo person, um, handled the bicycle, the and the traffic calming for the city, and then slowly picked up staff 
Um, uh, first was an intern, <laughs> then then became, you know, we hired a GIS person, then we hired a traffic technician, and then uh, well, we also had a pretty robust safe school safety program already in place, um, and those people came onto the team that I was leading, and so, you know, again, that's a city of about 200 square miles, about 400,000 people, so very large western city, about double the size of the population. So uh, we can look at other peer cities a little bit more, too, that are more you know, this size, but. Yeah, that would be helpful. I, I, I raise it because I get so many constituent <laughs> concerns and I, I'm always feeling a little guilty about sending them on to you because there are so many. There's a real eagerness to, to get those designated bicycle mm -hmm. areas done and, and the whole safety piece and it does very much tie into yeah. the pedestrian safety. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you could share some information about Pure Cities at some point, that'd be great. Okay. That's asking you to do one more thing, so. No, no, <laughs> but we have to do our sort of short range work program too, so it's um, having some comparisons and then looking ahead to how do we deliver, yeah. I think is important. Um, and how can we, you know, use our staff or do we need to continue to track with as many projects as we can, but we will not fill in those odd gaps at times that are often needed if we don't have a, a project that Rick's running perhaps, so. We mm -hmm. want to try to fill those gaps in between those projects if we can. It would be nice, though. I, d I don't see Becky Jo in the back, uh, but it would be nice to actually look at the data from 311 and, and see over time the number of calls and complaints we've received. I know it was probably about a year ago that I looked at comparable data from before Vital Streets mm -hmm. to where we were. We were, eh, it must have been about a year ago. And there was a marked decrease in the number of calls we were getting related to potholes and sidewalks and um, ADA ramps. So it'd be nice to get an update on that data and, and Becky Jo had provided a year over year mm -hmm. and a progression of a reduction in complaints. Right. Um, so we sh I think we should take a look at that. I, I have to believe with all of the investments that we're making, those complaints have continued to go down. So you're but until we have the information in front of us, it's so you're speculation. About looking specifically at things related to bicycles as yeah, well. Every, she, um, she provided uh, information on the number of, of calls we got for street trees, yeah. sidewalks, ADA ramps. So I think we could probably get that data. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that we've actually made some significant improvements. Mm -hmm. That's my oh yeah. Okay. That's my assumption. So I'm looking at our assistant city manager. Uh, oh, and if you now. could <laughs> get us all that data, I think it would be good to have. Um, Especially, it would be nice to have that coupled with the, with the annual update for the Vital Streets plan. Now, how do we also capture what goes straight to the department? I think, I think a lot of the, well, and, and to me, that's a data collection issue. They all should be captured somewhere, whether it's three, through 311 or another system. Uh -huh. I know we're looking right now at upgrading some systems, but we should be collecting all of that, that whether it goes to the department or 311. When we get, we see a lot of complaints online. Sometimes on Facebook, someone's oh, upset sure. about, you know, and so yeah. I'm always championing, please contact 311 or use the app. Or yeah. I, there has been requests for more um, features on the app, which I know that the 311 team is working on. Mm. It's just getting in that queue and what's the priorities because there's so many sure. priorities. And, but there are a lot of people who ride who say we'd love to report where a bike lane is filled with debris or hasn't been plowed or you know there's something wrong on the trail or and how can we report that easily because they're right there as opposed to having to call and maybe it's after hours on a weekend or um, so well and I do want to say too some of the complaints are about um, bicyclists following the traffic laws too and we need to we would love if we like just that. paid attention to Facebook, we would hear a lot of complaints yeah. oh, about yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to kind of have to be cautious about yeah. that. <laughs> All right, commissioners, any other questions or comments? Commissioner Part, did you have a question? No, I just want to say, I mean, I just got a new street myself. It's done. The engagement was great. You know, the, the plan was adjusted based on feedback. It's not 100% of what everybody wanted, but... Um, and it looks really great. I think that the, the traffic is going to flow better. They took special considerations in for the school. And so I'm, I know now firsthand, having watched it happen outside my street, what a great job the city staff does in kind of preparing the way for the project like that to happen. So glad to see that it's going to continue to happen all over the city. Yeah, it's a great plan. And Commissioner Kelly, thank you for all of your work.
over the years on this. So thanks. Assistant City Manager? Yeah, I, I just wanted to provide you an update. I got an update from, uh, from the CFO in regards to the bonds. Um, so it's an $18 million tranche of, of bonds that went out this time. It was a 10-year bond. There's no early payoff on those bonds, but it was at 1.75%. Okay. Um, so we feel like we've got a pretty good deal moving forward. Okay. Good, good, good. It's good to know. All right. Thank you. That's a quick response. Thank you, Mr. CFO in the back. Um, all right. Any other final comments before I move to the next item? Okay, thank you everyone. Appreciate the presentation and information. And I'm sure we'll get this out to the public so that they can have access to it as well. All right, commissioners, next that will take us to a West Michigan Express pilot project update. You may have read about this um, in the press or heard about it online. This has been a conversation that actually has been going on um, for some time. I know I've been briefed because of my role on the um, Interurban Transit Authority. So we have Mr. Uh, Josh Nearmore here to give us an update on this, which is really an exciting um, pilot project. All yeah. right, take it away, Mr. Nearmore. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and Assistant City Manager Matthews. Um, so this morning, as the Mayor mentioned, i um, here to talk about a, more, a project more regional in scope, but that does have some really great tie-ins to a lot of work that we're doing here in the city. Um, so I'm giving a portion of a presentation that's very similar that's being given to all the cities in the Chicago Drive Corridor by the city manager from Hudsonville, Patrick Waterman. Um, and so I've, I'm taking a little bit more of the leadership role in terms of doing it for the city and how this aligns with some of our strategic planning uh, initiatives. Um, so just a quick high-level overview of what is the West Michigan Express. Um, it's specifically looking and targeting the Chicago Drive Corridor, which runs parallel to 196, and that connects Holland to Grand Rapids with uh, pla uh, placement uh, in Zeeland, Hudsonville, and Granville along the way. So this is a collaborative effort that's to link all of those communities, but it's really specifically looking at increasing the mobility options for commuters within the corridor, because there's been a tremendous amount of employment growth, but one of the biggest barriers to getting people to the jobs within the corridor is they don't have any uh, travel options other than driving alone, which we'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so just here's a map that sets sort of the context generally, um, and then pulling some of the volumes from the Grand Valley Metro Council um, that is specifically looking at traffic volumes on a daily basis along Chicago Drive. So 196, in addition to this, has about 50,000 people uh, a day that are traveling on that. But just for Chicago Drive, it's a little bit more than 27,000 people, with the majority of that, about two-thirds of it, are folks that are heading from Holland into Grand Rapids. Um, so just try to set a little bit of the context uh, because I think it's really helpful to kind of state this is, you know, like many things in planning and transportation, what, what is old is new again. So with respect to this specific corridor, this is actually revisiting an old streetcar corridor that did historically connect uh, Grand Rapids out to each of these communities uh, and to the lakeshore um, that was removed quite some time ago. But that's why there are a lot of the, 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 the bones are existing in the, the corridor uh, today. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, so this all started about two years ago. Well, it started longer ago than that, but about two years ago, the city of Hudsonville, uh, based on a priority from their uh, city commission, um, had reinvigorated a previous 2012 effort to look at the feasibility for doing uh, commuter rail within the, the, this corridor connecting Holland to Grand Rapids. Um, but starting about two years ago, the city of Hudsonville uh, developed a whole partnership with all of the folks that are listed uh, on here to update that original 2012 report and to do a feasibility study to look at two things. One, it evaluated express bus and what that looks like, as well as evaluated and updated some of the costs associated with uh, a commuter rail. So this is a 40-mile stretch uh, of road. And so the initial results were that uh, running commuter rail is extremely resource intensive. It has a greater upfront capital cost and it has a greater operational cost associated with it. But the belief is that it has much better long-term economic impact. So with that being said, the, the belief uh, amongst the group in the feasibility study was to start with express bus service to really develop ridership <laughs> and develop the partnerships along the corridor. And so I'm gonna talk about that in a, a sense. But what the feasibility study said first is, we need to go out and work with the communities and the employers to have a better understanding of who's in the corridor, where do they wanna go, and what, what is the best to serve the needs of the folks within the corridor. 
So uh, a little over a year ago, uh, the West Michigan Express and all of the partners applied for a West Michigan Regional Prosperity Alliance grant. Um, and uh, with all of the partnerships with the chamber and the right place and a number of the cities, it was actually the, the highest rated project and received uh, 22, 000, a little over $22,000 to conduct the survey that I had just mentioned, to actually do targeted on the ground to work with the, those employers. Um, so the Frost Research Center at Hope College was utilized to develop the survey and to actually administer the survey. And originally they targeted 50 small, medium, and large employers that were, with, were all within two miles of the Chicago Drive corridor. So what they found is they targeted those 50 employers, but as soon as the survey was out on the street, a lot of other employers within the corridor uh, found out about it and started, word spread, traveled really fast. So they ended up getting uh, information and responses from 166 uh, employers uh, and almost 2,000 respondents in the survey, which is very similar to the downtown commuter census that uh, the city conducted in 2017, which we had a little over 2,000 people respond for that survey as well. So combining these two efforts, there's a lot of information we have, a better understanding of how folks want to get to the city and how some of our residents want to be able to access some of the employment just outside of the city limits. So here's a quick snapshot of some of the responses. I'm not going to go through all of these um, because this looked at Hope College, um, but one of the, in the lower right-hand corner, one of the very interesting things is one of the larger employers that responded, uh, a majority of the responses, was Spectrum Health. They're the region's largest employer uh, and heavy demand for locations within the corridor and connecting a lot of their employment groups uh, that live along Chicago Drive and commute into downtown Grand Rapids on a daily basis. There's also uh, approximately 70% um, of those that responded were interested in some type of service in the future. Um, one thing to note, uh, a little over 90% of those surveyed drive alone daily to access jobs or to get to Grand Rapids. So there's a huge, which is much higher than what it is for the, the city, it's a little over 80% for the majority of folks commuting into the city. But almost 40% were somewhat likely or very likely to use some type of commuter service if it was available. And 32% said the reason they drove alone was there were no options for them to get anywhere and they had to use it to be able to access uh, employment. So where we are right now, um, so currently this group of all of the cities has really been looking at expanding out what to do now that we've formed a group um, and we have a lot of great representation and participation. So the what is starting to flush out more of the details for how we would operate commuter bus service, what that looks like. Setting an initial goal is to attract about 1,000 riders a day and focusing on really high quality 15 minute service during the morning and evening peak and then running 30 day or 30 minute service for throughout the remainder of the day. Um, so this can't be done in isolation. So the group has been working very diligently with the RAPID um, as a regional transit provider, as well as the Makatawa uh, Area Express, which is uh, Ottawa County's transportation or transit provider. And so the RAPID has actually uh, stepped up to serve as the operator in charge, which means that they are helping to analyze and look at all of the operational assessment and then would be the lead in providing uh, the support for, uh, for applying for state operating assistance or any types of federal and state funding assistance. So they're exploring everything from over the road coaches contracted through Indian Trails to look at a private operator and could that lower some of the costs uh, for some of the initial pilot service or could they use other types of vehicles that are in the existing fleet today. There's also conversations of not just how do you get folks to the stops along the corridor but what about the first mile and last mile trips back and forth. So there's conversations with the Wheels to Work program to help provide shuttle service, uh, depending on how that meets for, for the shift, for the shifts um, that exist for the different businesses. So the last piece is, it's really important to note that there's nothing about a millage or there's no additional funding being requested to this. This is all being tried, this is all being focused on existing resources that are currently at the table. So there is no financial request associated with this. So right now, the West Michigan Express Group is trying to determine what the operating cost is and trying to identify some of the potential grant and funding opportunities to help augment that service. 
So as I mentioned, what's pending right now is uh, securing the gap funding and identifying some of those, getting the state to approve the operations plan for the service, and then beginning the work to work with all of the local municipalities and the transit agencies about where the stops are located, uh, park and ride lots, because this is a different type of service where you're going to need people to be able to drive and then access the service and then signing an agreement with an agency to be able to operate the service. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but they're hopeful that service could be in operation as, as soon as fall of 2020. And the idea is that this would, could begin to serve as a model for other types of inner city uh, transportation uh, to be able to connect all of the cities in West Michigan and across uh, the state. Because we know we have a lot of folks that are, you know, connecting outside of the Grand Rapids region and outside of the current service area for both uh, Ottawa County as well as for the rapid service boundary. So the last piece is just really talking about the city's support. Um, so to date, for both the feasibility study and then for the survey work, the, the city of Grand Rapids has contributed $15,000 to support both of those efforts. Um, and so right now, uh, the West Michigan Express, and led by the city manager from Hudsonville, Patrick Waterman, has been going out and trying to get public support from each of the municipalities along the corridor. So to date, um, the city of Hudsonville and the city of Holland have both publicly endorsed that, as well as just recently when we were preparing these materials, the Grand Valley Metro Council Board also did approve public support. Um, so they're really looking for us to provide technical assistance uh, to the group and then really eventually some marketing support. And then I wanted to highlight one thing is we're trying to use this as an opportunity to leverage other efforts that we have underway in the city strategic plan. So one, this falls into one of the mobility goals for coordinating with other regional transportation efforts. But also we want to look really diligently is that we have an opportunity when we're locating the stops as it comes into the city and being really mindful and thoughtful and intentional about that. So one is obviously we do want to connect to the medical mile because that's where one of the biggest destinations is as well as near downtown because the large employers are there. But we're currently going to be working and evaluating uh, how we could best find a location in the neighborhoods of focus to be able to serve where we can connect with multiple transit lines and provide a great opportunity to not just have folks connect into downtown, but actually the reverse commute for residents of our city that need to be able to access employment within the corridor. Because that continues to be a challenge of which we're really trying to, to be thoughtful about. Um, so we put together a draft of a resolution uh, for your consideration, just generically to offer public support for the project. But this is just an informational item. Uh, and this is something that we had been working with uh, the city manager and the deputy city manager on in terms of just pulling together a packet just for informational for you to be able to ask questions and, and get more comprehensive information. So that's all I have prepared today and then I can answer any questions. Okay, great. I'll turn to my colleagues for questions. Questions about this? I, I just have one question. Um, if you can uh, just kind of give me an understanding of what you mean by uh, commitment sentiment. I couldn't hear that last part. Commitment sentiment. What do you mean by that? You have commitment sentiment, 600 open-ended responses from survey participants. Can you explain what does that mean? It's your comments. In the memo itself? Yeah. I, I said commitment, but, I, but it, the word is really comment. Um, when I think about sentiment, I think about commitment as well. So um, comment sentiment, um, it's, it's uh, under the employee survey report where it says 600 open-ended responses from survey participants with 74% of them being positive. So I, Josh, not to answer for you, yeah. uh, but <laughs> my understanding from, from uh, what I've been briefed on and, and following this project is that when they, when they started to get responses from folks, the, the sentiment of the people who responded was overwhelmingly positive. So it's I think that's what that's yes. trying to capture. Yeah, I think what I really was looking for is there a commitment from these individuals who made these comments? Oh, uh, commitment to actually utilize the service? Yes. That, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't believe that it was framed that way. The, the piece that, so the, the mayor is correct that it's really just the, the sentiment is that people are really supportive of it. There wasn't a lot of negativity. But what we did is the survey did specifically look at somewhat likely or very likely to be able to use the service. And that's about 38% of those that, that responded to the survey. 
that that's the largest. There weren't, we weren't asking for people to sign up and right now and say, because I think there were a lot more questions of where is it going to pick up? How would I access the service? What's the schedule look like? Because if you're first mm -hmm. shift versus second shift versus third shift, uh, so how can we meet the needs of those within the, the, the area? Yeah, and I was glad to hear you say that the businesses were getting more involved and engaged in this because I think it's important. Yes. Yeah. Well, and commissioners, I will add, I don't know, um, I don't know how many of you have been following the Wheels to Work program. Uh, that was a, a program that was started in partnership with Walker and a number of employers out in Walker and the Rapid. Um, and the city actually was around that table as well, initially supported through Essential Needs Task Force and then grant funding through Kellogg Foundation. And uh, it, it will connect folks um, from really all over the city and region specifically to transportation to get to their jobs and the a portion of that cost is offset by the employers. That program, which started just, a, what, two and a half years ago, maybe, has grown exponentially, and they, are, they have a significant wait list of employers who want that service available to their employees. So I think if we can learn anything from the Wheels to Work program, uh, it, it shows us that there really is a significant demand and that transportation is a barrier, continues to be a barrier for employment. And, and I think this, this initiative and this pilot really builds on what we've learned from the Wheels to Work program. Um, Wheels to Work is now operating in multiple counties. Uh, and you know, long term, I think we need to think about what does that look like for the region and is it sustainable? Um, this could really help offset and be an enhancement to that program. The other, the other thing I will share with you is that uh, we've also heard some of that feedback uh, at the RAPID, and so we are embarking on a process called COA, it stands for Comprehensive Operations Analysis, and what that will do is it'll take us through a process to look at our current system look at the amount of money that we have, are we meeting the needs of the community, and does the transit system we have today meet the needs of uh, the transit system that we need in the future? And Josh is far more familiar with COAs than I am. I'm learning about this as we go because we haven't had one in well over a decade, maybe two decades. Uh, but we are, we are launching the COA process uh, actually next month. And there will be a lot of opportunity for community engagement and input in that process. So I'll make sure all of you know what that looks like and how you can engage. But I think it's, you know, as we look at Wheels to Work, at this pilot, at, um, at the Rapid, at some of the work that we're doing in Mobile GR, other modes of potential transportation, whether that's bicycles or e-scooters or May Mobility or smaller shuttles, we really need to think about what is our holistic vision for mobility, not just in the city, but really regionally. A lot of folks live in the city and they work outside the city and we need to make sure that transportation is not a barrier for them. Uh, so I think this is good timing uh, and I think it, it aligns with a lot of the other conversations that we're having around mobility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Commissioner Rappar? Yeah, and also housing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the Hudsonville's just built some really attractive housing downtown and this gives those people a chance to come and work in the city of Grand Rapids yeah. uh, or vice versa. And so. We're seeing that with the Laker line and the big development at uh, Wilson and Lake Michigan Drive. And uh, so I just think that it's attractive all around if we can dovetail it with a larger regional mobility strategy as well as a regional housing strategy. So glad to see that Housing Next was a part of it and we can be a part of that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely workforce development housing. As you all know, they're all integrated. Right. They don't operate in silos. So, Commissioner Kelly? Yeah, I have a question, um, Josh. I, I know I'm familiar with this from our presentation at Mobile GR, but um, are we, can we track the number of accidents that happen on the highway now? I know that both in our family, I've had my husband and my daughter both land in a ditch on that stretch once in the winter. It's pretty hazardous sometime going toward the lake shore. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they're fine. They didn't get hurt, but um, I think that, that makes a case too for um, getting some of the cars off the, the stretch. I don't know what the commute time difference would be, but I think that'd be an interesting thing to learn. And then hopefully we can give some of those respondents, which that was really incredible that so many people responded that um, when they heard about it, 
beyond the 50. We had 166 responding, and hopefully we can give them a chance to perhaps even financially contribute to some of the work that's going into the study. I imagine Spectrum Health might be considering that, but others as well may, may be willing to contribute. All right, Commissioner. How has the, uh, you know, I know this is pilot, piloted as a bus uh, system, but how has the uh, uh, railroad folks been to work with in terms of taking non-passenger rail lines and proposing them to be utilized to put people on? Well, that's why we're starting with pilot uh, bus service uh, is because, as most of you are aware, um, having conversations with railroad about sharing right-of-way is time-consuming um, and, and challenging from time to time. And so the, the idea is in order to be able to make the business case for that, we need to have sort of the ridership kind of built into it because we don't want, when we're looking at, you know, spending a substantial amount of, of public and even additional private resources, you want to make sure you have the core service there in place and that there's interest and that we've been able to do that. But it's very preliminary. And I know that there are some statewide conversations that are happening about the relationships to the railroad that the Michigan Department of Transportation has been leading. But I have not been tracking that. We've been really focused on trying to get the pilot bus service up uh, and running. Yeah. So it's a good question, a fair question. We can continue to provide updates on that as we. Yeah. It's a huge opportunity. And I, I know we've had those conversations before, and it can be really challenging to work with them. But you know, um, Commissioner, you bring up a good point, and it reminds me of um, the data we were able to collect uh, leading up to the Laker Line BRT, we had all of the data data from Route 50, and we were able to take that data and really build the case that there was a significant amount of need, and uh, and that's I mean when I remember going to DC and talking about the Laker Line uh, several years ago, and having that ridership and that foundation, I think was helpful in helping us get the funds needed to have the Laker Line BRT. All right. Any other questions or comments? Thanks. Thanks for this update. Uh, so, so Josh, my last question: Do you do you want us to to uh, have a formal resolution? Do you want us to voice our support today? So uh, that is actually something that uh, so Assistant City Manager Matthews can probably add more to that. But we had some conversation because I we know that historically that has not really been the the, yeah. the role of the city commission, but we were just looking for some type of general thumbs up around the table to move forward within our process. So what we did is based on some guidance, we followed and mirrored and did put in just a rough resolution that mirrors what Grand Valley Metro Council approved at their board meeting uh, a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, but I would defer to Assistant City Manager Matt. Yeah, I mean, typically we don't pass. Yeah, I mean, we, we yes. kind of have a, a few um, uh, parameters we put around resolutions, but um, with with our city's role in the project, uh, and specifically you and your department taking a role in the pilot, you know, I I think it would be worthwhile for us to affirm that. What are you thinking, yeah. Assistant City Manager? Well, the, the discussion because this is a multi-jurisdictional initiative, and and it is linked back to the strategic plan. Um, you know, there's some interest from the partners that uh, there's at least some symbolic commitment from the city that, that we're going to continue to be active and support it. And that's the reason why Mr. Naramore wanted to bring it forward is to get that feedback from you all. Uh, a resolution of support would certainly give them that confidence. It's something that, that you all are interested in doing. Um, but uh, I, I will leave that up to the body. If that's something that you'd like us to carry forward, we can bring it back at the next meeting. I, I'm open to it, and, and if we move forward with that, I would, I would like it to be explicit about how we're contributing to this, to this project, whether it's staff time or resources or technology, um, data collection, you know, how it connects with our neighborhoods of focus, where, where the transit stops would be. It would, it, it, I'm thinking of other uh, regional partnerships that we've had where it kind of spells out the role of the county versus the city versus, you know, Hudsonville or a township, you know, maybe pulling all that together with all of the key partners um, and why we're committed to supporting this pilot. Commissioners, do you all agree? Is there any concern about moving forward in, with that route? And I understand that 
um, Hudsonville has already made a resolution. Is that what you said in your presentation? Uh, the, the City of Holland, Holland and the City of Hudsonville, as well as the Grand Valley Metro Council, they okay. have been doing briefings with the other cities as well. Everybody has their own process uh, okay. and process uh -huh. to follow. Um, we, I did include draft resolution language in this agenda item so that you could react to and provide any feedback if you felt like something was missing. But we can work and put that on uh, the next meeting if, if you give us that direction. Yeah. I'm, I'm supportive of that, and, and just to remind everyone, we do have um, seats at the Metro Council, um, so the fact that the Metro Council has already supported it, I think that too uh, shows our support for the project. We have three individuals who sit around that table. So. All right. I'm supported. We'll have it come back to us at our next meeting. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Josh. Thank you. All right, commissioners, our last action item is a resolution authorizing negotiation and execution of a contract with National Research Center in an amount not to exceed $25,000 for development, execution, and analysis of a community survey. Can I get a motion? So moved. Support. Support. All right. I am so glad to see this come before us because I believe we have been talking about this for probably three years. Uh, Assistant City Manager, you want to tell us about this? Uh, would you like me to present from, from over there or over oh, here? Oh, you can present okay, here. Fair enough. Um, so yes, it's, it's something that's linked directly to the strategic plan. Um, and my understanding is that there hasn't been a uh, really an earnest community-wide assessment um, in at least a decade, if not a little bit more. When we looked at the options to be able to provide the survey, of course, there are some agencies locally um, who do that kind of surveying work. One of the things that we wanted to make sure, and something that I've found in my own experience, is uh, if you do your own survey and you don't have any benchmarks to compare them against, then you spend a lot of time asking yourself what the numbers actually mean. I, how do you set your targets if you don't know where you are relative to the performance of the industry as a whole? Um, so there's two leaders in that space. One is ETC, the other is NRC. Uh, NRC is affiliated, not affiliated, but is endorsed by ICMA, uh, and they've got a a pretty large bank of comps, both in terms of the state of Michigan, but also if you look at comps that are relative to the size and complexity of our organization. Um, so at least for this initial survey, we felt like it was important <coughs> to use a benchmark survey so that we can see how we compare relative to the market. And then if we choose to continue this process, whether it be annual, whether it be biannual, which is something that I would recommend, uh, then we can choose where we want to carry it forward from there. Uh, but because it's been as long as it has, because we have the new plan, we felt it was important to, uh, to link it up to some metrics that we can fill in some of the blanks that currently exist in the plan where we, where we have our TBDs, and those TBDs are really because we don't have those benchmarks to work from. Great. Thanks. Commissioners, any questions about this? <clears throat> Commissioner? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Matthews. Uh, so yeah, I'm absolutely very excited about the opportunity to do uh, some community engagement survey work. I'm, I, I'm struggling a little bit with this for a couple of reasons. One, I mean, I feel like it, you know, there are local companies that have the ability to do this type of work and ex work that's even expanded beyond the scope of the type of work that's being done here. And, you know, normally this process involves it going through the fiscal committee, not just right to the board. So I don't feel like there was an RFP process in place to actually know what was on the table other than, you know, obviously I trust you to do your job, but the fact that it wasn't out to see what other options existed, especially given the fact that there are people locally who engage in our community uh, more often. Um, the second is I just, I look at this and I, the, the idea of benchmarking is absolutely great, but um, this is, you know, reading through the, the proposal, it looks like it's basically a mailed out survey with a bunch of standardized questions on it. Um, and as we as a community struggle with a variety of different uh, issues that we continue to talk about, like for me, I feel like it might, there, there's probably more value in diving deeper into specific issues that relate to Grand Rapids rather than kind of this broad, uh, a, a more broad thing that I can bench myself against Tempe or Tampa or wherever else. Um, and so, you know, I also see the value in this is, you know, we send out a mailer, it's an extremely exhaustive survey, you know, we're getting ready to do census work, like, is there more value or could there be additional value in doing face-to-face -face engagement? Well, we continue to talk about authentic community engagement in Grand Rapids and, you know, I feel like the same voices continue to come back to the table and I know this is a large sample size of 1,700 households or more to get 
statistically re relevant information, but like, I feel like what we really lack is getting into neighborhoods uh, and having face-to-face -face interaction with people to, to really dive deeper into specific issues, not you know, this broad, you know, there's this, you know, we talk about it all the time when we vote, that there's like ballot exhaustion. And I look at the, the survey that, uh, the sample survey that's been provided, and you know, it's a number of, God, there's gonna be 100 plus questions on here, which I think is great data. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't d d d uh, debate the fact that the data could be valuable, but like, is that, at what level do you get exhaustion of filling out a 300 question survey uh, when there's, I think, five, 10, 15 things that we could really hone in on that I think would provide more insight to me as a commissioner, more insight to us as an organization about how the community really feels about things like community police relations or affordable housing or you know, public transportation strategies. And I just, you know, I'd like to see it honed in on something a little more uh, structured than just this broad thing that I can, you know, again, I think there's value to benchmark it against other communities, but I don't think that's what we need right now. I think what we need is to really be in on understanding the issues because I think there's some, uh, you know, maybe some confirmation bias that exists <coughs> in some of the feedback we get that, you know, we hear from specific people fairly regularly and that, that feedback's important, but I don't think we get the feedback from people in lots of, you know, of, across the spectrum of neighborhoods in Grand Rapids who aren't necessarily engaged in city governance, who aren't, who are reasonably happy most of the time, or reasonably upset most of the time with the way things go on. And I want to like, I really want to see how those people feel because I feel like we're not reaching those people uh, to, you know, whether you're on Granville Avenue or you're on the far west side, like, you know, I, how do how do those people compare when it comes to things like affordable housing and community police relations? So for what I'll, it's worth, that's, uh, no, that's, I, how I, I, that's how I feel. Yeah, I appreciate that input. And I'll let assistant city manager jump in, but I'll, I'll add a couple thoughts on that, Commissioner. One, uh, personally, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, you know, when I when I when we started talking about doing a citizen survey, you know, in my opinion, we should have done this years ago, and having talked to some of the other cities that have done it, it it really is best practice, and the the survey it is very detailed, but it goes into a whole host of issues, including an overview of of city services. And the, the mayors that I've talked to that have done a community survey, they then, once they have the data, they can go back and do another one in three years to look for improvements. They're able to identify where there are gaps in services or issues with certain services, and then I, and really look at how do you improve that. And then when you're able to look at comparative data from other cities, you can really start to see where you're doing well and where you're not, and then other cities that are doing better in certain areas, and you can learn what they've done to address the issues. Um, and the, the, and again, you can share some additional detail. My understanding is when you have this larger sample that is throughout the entire city, you do get a, a better mix of feedback that is from all of the different neighborhoods instead of just drilling down into one or two issues in certain neighborhoods, which is important to do. And that's why I'm saying I, I personally don't think it's either or. I think the, the, the on the boots ground, the face to face is important, but it doesn't provide this level of overall citywide feedback on a whole host of not just issues, but city services. Well, and, I, and I think, again, I'm, I'm not debating the merits of this. I mean, this clearly has value. It's clearly, you know, and I think the cost wise for $25,000, like you can't do a boot, you can't do a boots on the ground face-to-face inter -face interaction uh, engagement for that type of money. So like, again, I'm not debating the merits of this. I'm just saying, I want to know, like, we still haven't had the debate about, or the discussion about what it looks like to do something more, uh, more structured, more inclusive of Grand Rapids. And like, uh, before I commit to $25,000 to go down this path of, of what, again, the process to get to this point, it also doesn't seem like it was the right process. Um, then, like, I want a commitment that we're going to try to figure out how to do something else that actually gets to the core of the issues we're doing. Like, this is certainly valuable, certainly provides us great data. I mean, we're a data-driven city. This is going to provide a whole host of demographic data uh, with fairly high uh, statistical significance. I think that's great. Um, but I want to know what the next step is in terms of, like, really getting to the core of the issues that we're talking about. Because, you know, we can do this every three years and we can set a benchmark today. But, like, what's the, what's the follow-through on this of how do we get people, you know, t so we're not getting the same people giving us the same answers every time we <clears> ask it, because yeah. I think we're all uh, sick and tired of that. Well, um, and I'm, that's, I think we, we'll find that with this. But I'll let, I'll let the assistant city manager speak to process, recommendation, and then how this is one piece of 
ultimately what we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. when it comes to not only feedback but then also um, improvements. Sure. So, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, in short, you're both right. Um, the the really when you talk about engagement in the broad broader context. You've got the foundation, you've got the neighborhood piece, and then you have the ongoing feedback over time. And we're really trying to align all of those pieces concurrently. Uh, speaking specifically to the process, uh, there's only, there's two companies that do this work that have benchmarks. Um, the core difference between the two, from my own experience, is one does a more comprehensive paper process. The other leans much more heavily on telephones to be able to do the work. And um, the latter, there's always, there's been issues in my own experience with the validity of that feedback and how it skews to certain demographics, whether it be age or race or otherwise. Um, which is what landed us on a sole source recommendation as opposed to a competitive RFP. Uh, it was really that benchmark piece which sets the foundation, which gives us a point of reference. And it may be a survey that we do every three years or every five years, but in those intervening years, we've got the opportunity to focus in on specific areas that we feel like we need to get more information. And those are generally done with a combination of in-person engagement, virtual engagement, randomized engagement through the website, through social and other tools, so that you can aggregate that data from multiple places. Because um, I share the concern that you get the same voices into the room expressing some of the same opinions over time. And the only way that I've found to, to overcome that is to really blanket it across a variety of channels. Um, so this isn't exclusive in terms of our community feedback, but it is one of the foundational pieces when you talk about performance measures. Uh, and the strategic plan, of course, is built around the idea that we're moving on performance measures. Um, but it's not exclusive to that. Great. Thanks. Commissioners, any other questions or comments? Commissioner Kelly? Yeah. Well, when I looked at this, I was actually pretty impressed with the level of detail. And um, my thinking, too, was as things uh, come to light, that's when we go back out and do that deeper dive. So I appreciate your, your comments, Commissioner, about those deeper dives and the needs for that. But I, I also um, I, I, I like the idea of benchmarking ourselves against others because that can also, when things come up, if we can see what others have done to solve those problems, that will give us some sense of direction. All right. Well, I guess other, I, I um, did, Commissioner Moody, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say in reference to uh, Commissioner O'Connor's point, should this have come before the fiscal committee? Uh, that's, a, that's a good process question. I'm not sure why it was put on COW instead of fiscal. Assistant City Manager, do you know? Um, that was a discussion during agenda review, and we felt like um, because of the unique circumstances of this, uh, that it was best to have a a discussion with the whole body uh, before we made a decision to move it forward. There's also there's a timing issue there as well. The interest is to get this moving in time that we can have it as part of the discussions for the budget coming uh, up in November. So this would be time wise. This would be done over the next several so be months, over the and next then six we would weeks, and we would have it in October. And then we would have the information as we move into the next budget. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just, I mean, I just want to affirm what Commissioner O'Connor is saying as well. The interest, the information that I'm most interested in is face-to-face -face inter interactions about what we're dealing with here in Grand Rapids. Like, I, how we compare to Tallahassee or Tempe in some ways doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, I do think it's important, and I, so I, I, I do think it's a simultaneous thing. So I, I would like the the kind of commitment for us to return to that. What would it look like for us to go out? If the community is going to feel engaged, it's not going to happen from a survey that they fill out in their living room with a, <clears throat> with a number two pencil. It's going to be a conversation with somebody about what's actually happening here instead of generic questions about, you know, is your street clean? So I, I like the idea of benchmarking. I, I think that that's all well and good, but 
I too would like to see, a, I was, when, when we approved this in the budget, I was hopeful that it was gonna be more of that kind of door-to-door -door effort that gets us out a little bit more. And I think you get a different response when you're talking to somebody in person uh, rather than filling out bubbles on a sheet. But I just wanna affirm that sentiment. And I think that if we approve this, we want, I wanna see that commitment too to, to taking it forward and going that further step. Well, I, I, will, I will agree that I think they're both important, but I, I also don't want to minimize the importance of, of getting overall feedback on a number of city services. Every single one of us care about certain issues, but there is value when we're making decisions, which I'll give you a concrete example since you brought up how clean your street is. Yeah. We had a decision to make around this table about whether we increase how often we do street sweeping. And we didn't have any really good data to base it on other than some feedback, anecdotal feedback we got from the community. So if you look at how other cities use this data, it's not just about the big issues. They use it for the little issues too. They're able to identify where there is a greater need for street sweeping, where there are areas where there are street lights out, where there, it, it encompasses a lot of city services. Um, and again, not that, not that one of those is more important than the other. I think our job is to make sure that all of our city services, that we're getting feedback from the community on all of them, or <clears throat> we're identifying where we need to improve, and then we have benchmarks and we have data to show that actual improvements have been made. Um, <clears throat> the big issues, I couldn't agree more. We have certain big issues that we need to take a deeper dive in. Um, but again, I don't see this as, as either or. I think they're both just as important. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, I tend to agree. I think that it is more of a both-and approach. I, uh, I actually see tremendous benefit uh, in the survey itself uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, I think, at least for me, it helps that it's endorsed by ICMA. And again, the ability to compare to other cities, uh, I think, from a much more broader uh, perspective. But uh, to my colleague's point, to Commissioner O'Connor, I think that there is significant value in a deeper dive, and that's where I think we are uh, hopefully able then to tap into uh, some of the, more of the, the local content experts yeah. uh, for more of a, uh, a focus group type of setting, um, something much more personal, and to be able to set it up in such a way to where you know uh, targeted communities can engage uh, with folks to facilitate those conversations, um, and the folks who are facilitating the conversations are individuals that they trust. Uh, compared to a total stranger, so, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, Commissioner O'Connor, and then I'll call the question. Yeah, I, I was um, struck by what you said, Mayor, because if we can get this data, and we have, we certainly have universal goals, right? We have around streets about um, uh, street sweeping, um, potholes, you name it. But um, when, this, when this data comes in, to be able to look at that and see who's responding where, what pockets of the city perhaps are not seeing us reach those goals, those universal goals, and then we target those? I think that makes a lot of sense. So I, I do see it as a both end. Yeah, good point. Commissioner Connor, final thought, and then I'll call the question, and I'll ask um, the assistant city manager to follow up on what several of us said around this table is, you know, what is, what is our other plans to get to the more granular information? Yeah, I mean, that's just right. I'm, I'm supportive of doing this survey. I just want a commitment from all of us to, to do it now, not, you know, not in a year, not in yeah. two years, but soon. Like, we know, we know what's in, what, what, what is hot button, you know, and I think there's some, again, I think there's some missed sentiment that we're not capturing, and so I want, I want people to be out asking, you know, do you want more community police officers? How do you feel about the police department? What do you think about housing? You're like, get into like mm -hmm. the weeds on a couple of issues and yeah. make it a priority to do to tag you know the, whatever the issues of the day are that we're really struggling with. Like, let's do a deeper dive on a couple issues every year in that more face-to-face. -face, you know, whether it's door-to-door -door canvassing or focus groups or, or that real authentic type in-your-face engagement where we can meet people where they're at and have conversations about what uh, you know with people that we might not normally capture. And so I just want that commitment from us to say like, we're gonna do that sooner than later. Well, Commissioner, I will, I will add my commitment to that. And um, I will ask the assistant city manager to follow up with our city manager when he returns. 
We'll do that. Thank you. All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, commissioners. Um, so we are going to move item seven to our 2 p.m. meeting, and I'm going to ask us now to um, cast a vote to go into executive session. We have four items to discuss in executive session, uh, and so that will probably be a little bit lengthy. Uh, can I get a motion to go into executive session? Motion. So Support. All right. I'll start down here. Commissioner Part. Yes. Commissioner Moody? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. And Commissioner Jones? Yes. All right, and I'm a yes, so let's go down to the sixth floor.